Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Welcome to the Arts Club, the Arts Club at home. Um, and maybe soon we will be a combination of at home and actually at the Arts Club. Um, tonight, we are delighted to welcome Matthew Zapruder. He's a native Washingtonian, so give him that big DC welcome. Um, Matthew earned his BA in Russian literature at Amherst College, his MA in Slavic languages and literature at UCAL Berkeley, and an MFA in poetry at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he studied with Dara Weir, James Tate, and Aga Shahid Ali. Um, Matthew is the author most recently of Father's Day from Copper Canyon Press and Why Poetry, which is the book we're going to discuss tonight. Um, which is by Echo and Harper Collins. He's also the editor at large of Wave Books, where he edits contemporary poetry, prose, and translation. Please welcome Matthew Zapruder. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Dorit. Um, and thank you, Henry and Michael. And a special thank you to Sasha, um, who's doing the tech tonight. Um, I guess apparently it's a National Administrative Assistance Day. Is that right, Sasha? I think so. Um, so big, a big thank you to everyone who works, works in that area. Um, you make everything possible. Um, yeah, so I'm really glad to be joining you all. I'm sorry I can't be back in my hometown visiting the Arts Club. I got a little glimpse through a Henry Zoom uh, window of what it looks like, and I'm, I'm, it made me feel even more sad that I wasn't there but um anyway we'll do we'll we'll, we'll enjoy being together virtually and uh yeah so um I thought what I'd do is just read a bit from the beginning of why poetry and talk a little bit about it and then uh, maybe read a few poems and then kind of open things up and we can we can talk um the book really was written um to start or continue I guess maybe a conversation that I've been having for a long time I mean when I first became a poet um, and even before I became a poet, I had a lot of questions about poetry, you know, what it was and how to read it and, and, and why it was so hard to understand or could feel sometimes so hard to understand and sometimes not. And so I decided, um, I think poets instinctively a lot of the time shy away from those questions or engaging with those questions. Um, you know, they just sort of want to say for understandable reasons, you know, just read the poems or just read my poems or read poems and you'll understand. And, and that's in some ways good advice, but it's obviously not enough. So I just thought I would start writing and see what happened and see if I could write something that would be helpful. And I ended up writing this book. Um, it began, I began writing it, I think in around 2013 or 14. Um, and I finished it right uh, at the, right after the 2016 election. So the book begins with a lot of personal kind of, um, you know, uh, anecdotes or, or, or um, kind of like autobiographical stuff that enters into, um, uh, you know, a description or an attempt to get it like what poetry is and how it works or whatever. And then it moves through a lot of different topics, talks about metaphor and symbols and, uh, dream, dream meaning, and all kinds of things, and looks at poems pretty closely, and then, but it ends with a um, with a piece about how we respond to crisis um, as poets, and what how poetry can help us in times of crisis, and um, yeah, and then we had four years of pretty overt crisis, um, which continue now with this um, pandemic and our ongoing ecological crisis, and 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 um, and structural racism and violence and uh, many, many other things that we're dealing with. And so, yeah, uh, it's, it's a book that kind of enters into that stream of thought, has some things to say, has some questions about it. And then, you know, it's part of an ongoing conversation. So um, anyway, I'll just, I'll just read a bit from the beginning of the book um, and I'll try to read um, a little bit of something that connects particularly with the um, Washington DC area, where as Dorit said, I grew up. So um, yeah, here we go. Um, I have a confession to make. I don't really understand poetry. For over 25 years, I've heard this said over and over in slightly different ways by friends, family, colleagues, strangers I met 
on ba- in bars and at dinner parties, on planes. So many people, practically everyone who found out I was a poet. Clearly there's something about poetry that rattles and mystifies people, that puts them off, that makes them feel as if there's something wrong. Maybe the problem is with them as readers. Maybe they don't know enough or haven't studied enough or weren't paying attention in school. Or maybe the problem is with poetry itself. Why don't poets just say what they mean? Why do they make it so hard? Like classical music, poetry has an unfortunate reputation for requiring special training and education to appreciate, which makes most of us feel unnecessarily as if we haven't studied enough to read it. In his widely read introduction to the best poems of the English language, the late Harold Bloom writes the following. The art of reading poetry begins with mastering elusiveness in particular poems from the simple to the complex. That's elusiveness with an A. So allusions to other texts. This is not true. The art of reading poetry does not begin with thinking about other cultural products or historical moments or great philosophies. It begins with reading the words of the poem which sounds very simple and is, except that it quickly becomes very interesting. Reading poetry, we need to remember we're all experts in words. We have been for a long time. And any word we don't know, we can look up in the dictionary that will be beside us when we read. Um, So that's kind of how the book begins. And then it talks a little bit about, um, you know, what what poetry is and what it tries to do as a specific genre. Um, And I just want to read a bit from further on in the book um, about my first memory of having read a poem, um, which happened when I was very young. And we were talking before um, before everybody came in to the Zoom. And um, I I went to Oyster Elementary School when I lived in Washington, D.C., you know, which and the old build, I guess it's moved, but the old building used to be right up against Rock Creek Park there um, uh, right near where the, what, what used to be the Sheraton Hotel and is now, I don't know what hotel it is, but it's, it's there right 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 in, the, in Woodley Park. So um, I'm gonna read a little bit about um, my, first, my first memories of having uh, come across poetry. Long ago, I had a deep and private experience with poetry. It was 1972 and I was in first grade in Washington, DC. I went to Oyster Elementary, a small school just a few blocks away from our little row house. Oyster was bilingual, which meant that we took turns holding up pictures of things, duck, house, ocean, and solemnly saying both the English and Spanish words. In the morning when we entered our classroom, it was bright. And in the afternoon, the sun was on the other side of the building, leaving our room dark and melancholy. On the windowsill were many books, among them a large one, Longfellow's The Song of Hiawatha with big ornate letters and colorful drawings. I loved to go to the window and read it. Often I would get up when the teacher was talking and just wander over there. This was uncharacteristic. I was an obedient eldest child, a little bit afraid all the time of making a mistake or doing the wrong thing. Our classroom windows faced east, directly over Rock Creek Park, a mostly wild forested expanse that ran right through the middle of the city. I remember standing next to the window, holding the book, knowing the great park with its massive stone bridges and trees and river was very close, right there. By the shores of Gitche by the shining big sea water, stood the wigwam of Nokomis, daughter of the moon, Nokomis. Dark behind it rose the forest, rose the black and gloomy pine trees, rose the firs with cones upon them. Bright before it beat the water, beat the clear and sunny water, beat the shining big sea water. Now when I read this passage, it makes me cringe because of its offensive primitivism, its fantasy about how thin Indians thought and spoke. The poem also seems a bit silly in the way it says obvious things, like the pine trees have cones. But I must confess, I still do love how he calls the lake the Ojibwe knew as Gichigami, and we call Lake Superior Big Sea Water, an example of how something familiar can, when it is said in an unexpected way, become new for us again. It still sounds solemn and good. Saying it out loud, I feel now, as I did then, the elemental force of the words. Forest, 
pine trees, them, water, water, water. There seems to be meaning in the sounds themselves. Robert Frost writes, the best place to get the abstract sound of sense is from voices behind a door that cuts off the words. This makes me think of listening to my parents talking in another room or downstairs. In those hums and murmurs, there was so much information about mood, the emotional weather in the house, all to be gotten without hearing a single clear word. As a child standing at the window, knowing that right there just on the other side of the walls was the great park, the huge trees, and the river that had cut a deep canyon before the capital city had ever been imagined, the entire system of the poem acted on me, helping me feel an immense sublime force, something true about the old land that had been here long before us. For better and worse, with all its tragic, complex, at times misguided, and at others deeply intuitive sense of mystery, the Song of Hiawatha was my first poem. Many of you must have your own. Let us go then, you and I, where evening spreads itself against the sky. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. I placed a jar in Tennessee. When I get to be a composer, I'm gonna write me some music. My life, it stood a loaded gun. Oh, there is blessing in this gentle breeze. I celebrate myself and sing myself. Won't you celebrate with me what I've shaped into a kind of life? Um, I was asked to write a poem for an anthology of, it was the 15th anniversary of an organization um, founded by Dave Eggers called 826 Valencia. I think you might have one in DC as well. And um, it's a tutoring organization for I was muted by the host, I guess. Maybe uh, it's not a big Dave Eggers fan, I guess. Um, but uh, I, uh, I um, anyway, I, I was asked to, uh, to um, write a poem about, for this anthology, and so I did. And so it was, it's addressed to 15-year-olds, and I thought it would be, again, like appropriate to read it because um, I, uh, you know, this is sort of thinking about myself growing up in the D.C. area, the DMV. So when I was 15... When I was 15, I suddenly knew I would never understand geometry. Who was my teacher? That name is gone. I only remember the gray feeling in a classroom filled with vast theoretical distances. I can still see odd shapes drawn on the board and those inscrutable formulas. Everyone was busily into their notebooks scribbling. I looked down at the Velcro straps of my entirely white shoes and knew inside me things had long ago gone terribly wrong and would continue to be. When the field hockey star broke her knee, I wrote a story for the school newspaper, then brought her the history notes in the snow. She stood in the threshold, a whole firelit life of mysterious familial warmth glowing behind her and took them from my hands like the blameless queen of elegant violence she was. Walking home, encased in immense amounts of down, I listened to the analog ghost in the machine, pour from the cassette I had drawn flowers on. Into my ears it sang, everything they told you makes you believe you're trapped in a snow globe, forgotten in a dark closet, where exhausted shadows argue what is sorrow cannot become joy. But I'm here from the future to tell you, you are not. All you must do is stay asleep a few more years. Great traveler waiting to go. When I read that poem on the West Coast, nobody knows what I mean by the down, like encased in immense amounts of down. Nobody understood. Everybody was like, what? <laughs> but, but you all know what I'm talking about. Um, my big puffy down jacket. Um, so... I wrote this poem. So, you know, you know how you all probably ride the Amtrak um, and you know how they have that magazine in there that nobody ever reads. Um, it's called the national actually. And um, 
for some reason, the the people who do that magazine decided that they wanted to have a some a poet write a poem for each new issue of the National, and so um, and you know they paid rather handsomely. So I said, uh, so I said yes, of course. Um, and so I wrote this this poem because, I mean, like like I'm sure many of you uh, living in the D.C. area, I took that train, you know, the Northeast Corridor a lot. Um, you know, to go to New York or to go to, I went to school in Massachusetts and just, just on it all the time. So um, it was kind of fun to remember, um, to remember that. And I was thinking when I was writing this poem about how, you know, I mean, this is nothing original about this thought, but about how divisive our lives, our politics, our public lives have become, you know, how conflict and strife is just inextricable with almost every public fact of our lives you know once we leave our houses either literally or virtually and but there are still these rituals these communal rituals in which if that stuff doesn't fall away by any means but it it, it sort of recedes for a moment and we're all sort of doing the same thing um and one of those moments is getting on a train um and and waiting for it to start so anyway this poem's called poem for passengers Poem for Passengers. Like all strangers who temporarily find themselves moving in the same direction, we look out the window without really seeing or down at our phones trying to catch the dying signal. Then the famous lonesome whistle so many singers have sung about blows and our bodies shudder. Soon we will pick up speed and pass the abandoned factories there's lately been so much conversation about. Through broken windows, they stare, asking us to decide. But we fall asleep next to each other, riding into the tunnel, sharing without knowing the same dream. In it, we're carrying something, an empty casket, somehow so heavy, only together can we carry it over a bridge in the snow. Emerging suddenly into the light, we wake and open our laptops or a book about murder or a glossy magazine. Though we're mostly awake, part of us still goes on solving problems so great they cannot be named. Even once we've reached our destination and disembark into whatever weather, for a long time there's a compartment within us filled with analog silence. Inside us, the dream goes on and on. Um, I'll read one more poem. Um, this poem is kind of oddly pertinent um, to our current lives. Um, it was not intended to be when I wrote it. Um, I was thinking about how weird it would be to write a viral poem and how weird that term was. And this was again, long before our, our current viral predicament. Um, like that it's that it's sort of a term of approval, um, a viral poem, but how sinister it always sounded to me and how kind of um, odd it would be to write one thing that everybody loved. And then to, I, I, I would personally imagine that it would become completely silencing. Um, thankfully, I'm, I'm in no danger of having that happen to me. So, um, <laughs> but I imagined, I imagined being uh, someone who had done that in this poem. So I'll read this poem and then I'll stop and I'll do one more thing and then we can open it up for conversation. So um, this poem is called The Blackbird. The Blackbird. I wrote a poem once. I thought it was to be honest, just okay. Then it went viral. Everyone loved it. And soon enough, I almost did too. Though I also knew something nameless, I pushed down ever deeper. I wrote more, a whole book named after the viral poem. It won all the awards. People even really named a whole conference after it and wept when they even thought about it. It was far too much, so extreme it had to be real what I had done. Now, whenever I try to write, I feel so afraid of feeling nothing. So I just write house and war and dapple. Everyone smiles and says yes. But really, I just want to get high and sit on the porch of my heart, 
yes of my heart, that's what I said, where I can watch the city go by and imagine buildings have feelings. But whenever I close my eyes and try to go there, I only see a black bird with a yellow beak staring at me. I keep waiting, but it just stares back at me and does not speak even one word from the other world. Um, so I thought what, what, one of the things that began this book, Why Poetry, that I wrote was um, I, had, I had written a talk uh, uh, that I gave to the, um, to the uh, Tin House Summer Writing Workshop. And it was a, a lot about uh, John Ashbery, the poet John Ashbery, who's not alive anymore, um, who's sort of considered, you know, uh, on, on, on the spectrum of difficulty, he's considered a more difficult poet or elusive poet, let's say. And, um, um, and he, he's a poet who, when I first started reading poetry, I had a lot of trouble with, and then something just clicked for me. And so I thought um, I'd write a, I'd give a talk about that experience. And then I did, and that sort of got me thinking a lot more about some issues that eventually produced this book, Why Poetry. But I thought maybe I would read one poem by, by Ashbery and um, I can share it on the screen. And then I'm just hoping that in the chat while I'm reading it, people will just write things that they notice about the poem, not you know, big interpretations or big ideas or what they think it all means or what it's about, but just simply things that they notice. And then maybe we can, we can talk about it a bit or you can ask questions about it or whatever, but I'd like us to focus our minds on just simply observing, observing um, as much without judgment or an attempt to, to gather the whole thing up into some one big idea as I, as I read it. So anyway, I'll share it. Um, so hold on, it's gonna take me a second because I have to get it going. Um, and yeah, the poem is called Paradoxes and Oxymorons. And it is a, um, um, it's a poem from Ashbury's book, Shadow Train. Um, and yeah, here you go. I'm gonna share it right now. Let's see, sorry. We practiced this. It's amazing. We practiced this and I was bragging about how good I was at it. And then, and then I look at me having trouble doing it. Okay, but now I'm going to get it. Because it even now, now I'm going to get it, but it's also even a bigger size so everybody can see it. All right, there you go. Okay, Paradoxes and Oxymorons by John Ashbury. Everybody can see it, right? Thumbs up, Dorrit, if you can see it. Yeah. Paradoxes and oxymorons. And please, yeah, like I said, just in the chat, anything you know, anything you notice at all, anything you see. This poem is concerned with language on a very plain level. Look at it talking to you. You look out a window or pretend to fidget. You have it, but you don't have it. You miss it, it misses you. You miss each other. The poem is sad because it wants to be yours and cannot. What's a plain level? It is that and other things, bringing a system of them into play. Play? Well, actually, yes, but I consider play to be a deeper outside thing, a dreamed role pattern, as in the division of grace these long August days without proof, open-ended. And before you know, it gets lost in the steam and chatter of typewriters. It has been played once more, I think you exist only to tease me into doing it on your level, and then you aren't there or have adopted a different attitude. And the poem has set me softly down beside you. The poem is you. So that's Paradoxes and Oxymorons by Ashbery. I'll leave it up for a second so people can take a look. All the poems in Shadow Train are in the same form here that Ashbury invented of these like um, stanzas that are all four lines like this. It's a really great book. Um, I recommend it. So anyway, well, I wonder what people wrote in the chat. 
Um, poem is talking to me in the poem, repetition of words. You have it, but you don't have it. Call to your imagination. The idea that the thinking of a poem resists proof. Yeah. Personal engagement with the poem addresses the reader directly. Yeah, that's that's one of the most striking things about the poem, right? Is that it, and I remember when I first read it, I thought, oh my God, this is so cool. Like the person is right there talking to me. You know, like like uh like there there's like actually a voice that's like trying to reach out to me, you know. Um and I'm not gonna get to all I I'm gonna I'm sort of trying to keep one eye on the comments here, but um, but um they're really great. Um yeah. Janine, it says again beautifully, the, this poem speaks to us personally, almost erasing the poet, a direct line from the poem to the reader. Yeah, it's, say, it's like, it's like almost, it's very impersonal. It's not, you know, like, um, even though there are details and images as someone else mentioned, it's not autobiographical or like necessarily or about, you know, someone's individual experience or it's about some kind of connection that's being made or desire to make a connection which can feel I think applicable to so many different circumstances, you know? Yeah, poem, poetry can be personal and impersonal simultaneously. That's one of the really cool things about it, yeah. Wants to engage us. I know that desire that the poem seems to have, which is, I mean, I find it like sweetly comical kind of in a way, like the poem's sort of desperation to, to like be, to make a connection with us. It's like, we, I think so many of us might, think of poetry as something elusive or that's trying to stay away from us. But what if we thought of poems as something that were, that were, they were trying to make contact with us and maybe we were the ones who were being elusive, you know, like that's like sort of a, like just, just, huh. What if, what if we imagined that that was really, the problem wasn't the poems. The problem was that we're, we're, we're playing hard to get, <laughs> you know, uh, what if, what if we made ourselves more available? You know, what, what would happen? Um, um, yeah, a uh, little shot at Ashbury. You can count on that from Richard McCandless that that's the first Ashbury poem you liked. Okay, um, there are more. Um, yeah, so anyway, I mean, like I said, you know, I, I love that poem for many reasons. And um, I also think it's kind of funny the way it talks about, it, it's almost like the poem itself becomes a student, like it's fidgeting and looking out the window so that so what the poem is shifts around a lot and and then at the end i feel like it becomes kind of like a lover you know the poem is but but it's like but not really because it's set me you know it, it, it like it shifts it's like something else but then it is you and it's like it's very yeah it's it's like fragmented you know my sister thinks it's sad that's interesting do other people think it's sad i don't know Funny and sad, I guess, both. Yeah. Oh, I said, oh, no, you don't think it's sad. You just think of the poem as sad because it wants to be. Yes, that's that's a funny moment, yeah. Um, well, okay, I just thought it would be nice to talk a little bit about, about Ashbury poem, and I'm happy to answer more questions about it and talk more about it. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm happy to answer questions now or open it up, and or Dora, I don't know if you had questions or other people wanted to ask or... Yeah, um, I was going to say either put your question in the chat or wave frantically so that someone can see you. I cannot see 62 boxes. So if it's better to tell us in the chat that you've got a question and someone... That's a hand raise function. How do they do it? I, I don't use it. Under reactions, I think. And yes. You go under reactions and then you Hi, raise This hand. is Sasha. So someone here, yes, I, I have the, I see Rachel Hartick raising her hand now. So um, go ahead, Rachel, if you'd like to um, you ask your question. You want to unmute her? Unmute, yeah, please um, unmute yourself, Rachel, and ask your question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if, as you've read the poem over the years, the meaning has changed for you, if you find significantly different things in it in later readings? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I, mean, I think like, I, I mean, I'm just like generalized a bit, like for the poems that I really love, you know, and, and there, are, there are a fair number of them. Um, they do change over time because of my concerns. So I see different things in them or I notice different things in them. And each time I read that poem, I see something different or something different is emphasized for me. I mean, I think probably when I first read it, it was really a lot about understanding poetry for me. 
And now maybe it's a little bit more about um, how humans can miss each other, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, it's, 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 that's not to say that's a better reading. It's just, it's just like, I, I think your question was the right question, Rachel. Like as, as I change, I've, I've, I've read the poem differently, you know? Um, and, and a great poem will just have those different facets. And that's why I don't, I mean, that's one among many reasons why I don't like, um, like, you know, these very rigid interpretations of poems because they're not, I mean, W.H. Auden has a famous remark that he made, you know, where he said, uh, uh, well, I don't know about famous, but <laughs> well-known remark. Um, he says a poem is a kind of pseudo person. And, and, you know, like a person, a poem changes, you know, at different times. And getting to know a poem is a constantly evolving thing. So, Are you able to see all the questions people are putting in the chat? I'm kind of keeping half an eye on them. And I, do you want me to answer them or adore it? Or do you want to, I, I'm, I mean, I'm I can those. tell you the, you know, the one that I saw. Um, Dord, this is Sasha. I do say um, Idran has his hand raised and he's um, off. He's, um, he's there with us on video. So Idran, Idran, okay. please um, ask your question, sir. Sure. Um, it's, uh, it has, Matthew, thank you very much for your presentation. Do you think, uh, can you speak about the role of, uh, of, of, with your hat on as an editor, as a poetry editor, vis-a-vis -vis current events and poets writing in response to current events? Um, does poetry, going back to Orton, make something happen? Or is that a secondary function or almost an appendage of what a poem does? And, and, and so if you could sort of reflect upon the role of the poetry editor and, and politics, yeah? Thanks. Oh, politics, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a big question. Thank you, Idran. Indran. Um, I, uh, you know, I have done quite a, quite a bit of editing in different ways. I was the editor of the New York Times um, Sunday uh, poetry page. That's an annually rotating position. I did it for about a year and a half. And I'm also the editor of a, a pu poetry publishing house called Wave Books um, that has, you know, had quite a, quite a few um, well-known books published recently. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't really think about necessarily like that the main role of a po poet or poem is to like change the world. But then again, I mean, we saw a recent example of a poet come along, you know, at the inauguration who, who was exactly the right poet at the right time to kind of like gather up whatever tattered like shards of like good feeling and hope we had somehow into a poem and do do a real service so i think i think that that was you know that was like a um like a you know an instance of like where that a poet did do that service and did really do something important for like the body politic or whatever but i don't think you know that that's like you know the highest aspiration of a poem but or has to be um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's, but it's, you know, an attempt. I, I am going to throw a quick question out. Cause one thing sure. I was struck by in the book was how you kept saying it's not an Easter egg hunt. The poet isn't going around hiding meaning so that you have to run around with your basket and find it. And I think for a lot of people who are here tonight who might be beginners, just to talk a little bit about what the poet's doing and how it's not a deliberate hiding of meaning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a big part of the book. I mean, I think that we're 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 taught for various reasons um, that a poem is kind of like a riddle. You know, it's it's this like it's it has like a message, and it's deliberately kind of made, you know, hot, hidden or made secret or complicated or whatever. And our job as readers is to like crack the code. You know, like that's that's sort of like the way we're taught and. You know, I really don't think that that is how the vast majority of poems work. Yes, there is the occasional exception of a poem that works like a riddle. And yes, under certain circumstances of political oppression, you know, it may be true that poets hide their meaning. But basically, that's not really how poems work. They're, they're kind of like the opposite of riddles. Like I say sometimes, like to my students, you know, that, that like a riddle is something really simple that's said in a deliberately complicated way. And a poem is the opposite. 
It's something very complicated and elusive that's said in the simplest way possible. Now, sometimes that isn't a very simple way to say it. You know, and, I, and, and like when my students complain, I say, well, you know, you're, some of you are math majors, some of you are physics majors. Do you complain when that gets complicated? No, because what's trying to be described is complicated, you know? So, it's, so that's why it's complex, you know? Sometimes things get complex because life is complex, but it's not, that, it's not that there's a deliberate attempt to make it complex. That would be kind of um, antithetical to the spirit of almost every single writer I know who wants to communicate and wants to be. And that's one of the reasons why I like that Ashbury poem so much, because that desire to connect is made so apparent in the poem and so obvious. And I feel like that, that desire that that is expressed in that poem is really connected with so much of the impulse of poetry writing that I see. Hi, Dort, this is Sasha. I do have a couple of folks who've patiently had their hands up for a couple minutes. Um, Catherine Baker, then Michael Whalen, and then we do have some chat questions. So Catherine, do you wanna ask your question, please? Katie? Um, yeah, I, I put my question in the chat, but um, I'll just um, tell you what it, what it says. Um, first of all, thank you, Matthew, for your uh, excellent presentation. And I wondered if do you think your study of languages starting at a young age and then on into your university years ha has helped you to express yourself? Uh, because I think your writing is absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you for saying that, Katie. I've come from you that I appreciate that. Um, the um, I think, yeah, for sure. But I, I would almost say, like, retrospectively, what I noticed is my interest in languages, and and frankly, I mean, my facility. I mean, I'm 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 bad at a lot of things. Um, from, from the difficult to the simple. But one thing I do seem to have a facility for is, is, is languages and, and words. And I think part of it is just that I'm really interested in them and I like them and I like the, I like the material of language. I like the different way different languages work. Um, it, just, it just interests me. Um, and I think that what I came to see, and I write about this in Why Poetry, is that that was actually a characteristic that, um, explains why I was drawn to poetry because it's not, it's not even so much that it made me a better writer or made me a better poet, though I'm sure it did. It's that it, it's all part of the same, just attraction to the material of language. You know, I so you know, some people like sculptures, you know, they like the, some people like paints, some people like cameras, you know, my mom loved cameras, you know, some people like, like cooking, they like food, they like utensils. Some people like car engines. I like words, you know, and so it's not, it's not really that grandiose. I mean, it's, it, it's actually just kind of like pleasure for me. And, you know, I'm the nerdy kid who liked diagramming sentences. You know, I deliberately took Latin in high school. You know, like I just, that's what I liked. And, and, and you know, it's, 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 it's weird because in our culture, that sounds so like, oh, you know, but, but it just, it could have been anything. It could have been woodworking, you know, but that's just what I happen to like. So you know, and, and I think that's, and so when I found poetry and being a poet, I was like, oh, this is the thing that I can do that lets me do, that lets me do that stuff with the material that I like. It gives me this Ooh. chance to just play and, and find meaning, you know, Ooh. instead of dictating it. Yeah. So it's kind of selfish in a way, actually. I felt sort of bad when I realized that, like it was, <laughs> it, was it felt so selfish. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, you're, you're you know. lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think you know. I mean, it has. I mean, it's just complicated because poetry has this weird cultural resonance. You know, it's like you say you're a poet. I mean, it immediately co comes with all these different, you know, associations that are kind the of the correct absurd. expression is buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I, I used to joke with my wife. I mean, she would drag me. I mean, my wife is an urban planner, and she she would drag me to these not drag me. She'd bring me to these parties, and you know, I knew, I knew what was going to happen when I went, I, I would do anything to avoid saying what I did. You know, I'd say I was an English professor. I'd say I was, a, but there's some people who are just determined to keep asking questions until finally I have to tell them that I'm a poet. Mm -hmm. And then as soon often when I did, like people would literally take like a step back, 
like as if I was about to like unroll a giant scroll and start like reading my poems to them or something. And I was like, look, I'm just trying to get through this party. Like, like this is my wife's party. Like, I'm just trying to get through this party so I can go home and like watch, watch Netflix or whatever, you know, like I'm not going to read you a poem. Don't worry. But like, yeah, yeah. People do have those associations with that for sure. So one more hand up door. Um, Michael Whalen had a question and then we can go to chat. Yeah. Michael? My question. Yeah. My question is, is, uh, your, the actual title of your book, which I like, Why Poetry? And uh, it's uh, like a question is, overall, are there multiple whys? Or is there some mega why that, as you perceive it, is, is the thing, why poetry? And implicit in that, to me, is the other deep, deeper like overall question, what is a poem? Is it like the same as what is a chair? It's an ontological thing, or does it have so many multiples? things that it changes what keeps on changing shapes and of course what people happen when they when they hear that there's going to be a poem i've seen this written someplace i don't know who said it but i think i agree with it that people perk up even if they're not going to understand it they have a different way of listening as soon as they hear it, it's going to come as a poem and and the best case scenario i would i would i would agree um yeah the the um i think there's also an equal um tendency of people to flinch and immediately like sort of assume already that they don't understand what's going on. But um, so both things I think are there. I agree with you, Michael. Um, the title of the book is, relates to what you're saying about like, um, about what a poem is. I don't think that's the most useful question because, uh, well, that's something I came to understand is that what a poem is leads to roads, leads to very um, taxonomical and ultimately like not very useful distinctions that almost always turn out to be, to have so many exceptions that they're not, that they're, they're not. So, you know, I, I mean, I've been involved in countless conversations where people try to say like, oh, you know, poems have to do this or they need to be this way or they need to be that way. And, and it's like, you just end up saying, well, what about this poem? What about that poem? What about this poem? What about that poem? But the, the why of it, why do people write poetry? Why do they come back to it? Why do they feel like they need it? And, you know, part of maybe my thinking that was remembering, um, you know, after 9-11 that like, you know, I remember at, the gatherings after 9-11, uh, you know, the World Trade Centers came down the, the, and Pentagon tacked and everything. The, the, the um, people read poems. You know, they didn't sing. There wasn't a lot of song singing. There were people didn't read short stories. They didn't read essays. They didn't read. There weren't very many sermons. I remember people would write, read poems. Why? Why poems? What is it, what is it about that particular form of expression? That, that we seem to need. And that, so, so, so it had to do with functionality and even the old fashioned, um, very obs seemingly obsolete uh, idea of genre. You know, everybody likes to talk about crossing genres and, and, and mixing genres or whatever, as do I, but there is something interesting about thinking about poetry as a genre, because genre is really about purpose and about function. You know, so what does a poem do that a sermon doesn't do and a newspaper article doesn't do and a, a short story doesn't do and a novel doesn't do, et cetera. So that, that's to the poem. The book try, attempts to investigate that. Somebody mentioned how should a poem mean the John Chiardi book, which is in the same realm as this book. I think it's, it's an excellent, it's an excellent book. It's, it's old. I think it's 50 years old, but um, which isn't that old actually. <laughs> it's how old I am, but, uh, but um, it's, 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 it's from a ways back and, and it's, it's good. It has the same kind of idea that like, what is not, what is a poem is not the most useful question. So he writes, but you know, how does a poem mean? It's, it's, it's in the same area as my, as what I've written. Sasha, does anyone else have their hand raised that I can't see? No, um, there are no more hand raises. So whatever questions you want to engage with in the chat, I'll leave that to you, Dort and Mike, Matthew. Um, can you see them, Matthew? You want? Yeah, I'm just looking. Um, somebody asked about literary critics. I think that's, I mean, I see a lot of commentary that I'm trying to follow along with. Sorry that I can't see everything. Um, but um, uh, um, yeah, literary critics. I mean, are there any critics we should read? Um, you know, there's a lot of very good writing about poetry right now. 
I don't see a lot of good close reading of poems. And that was another thing I really wanted to do with my book is I wanted to really go through poems in detail and take the time to kind of start at the beginning and start asking questions and asking what, what, I, what, what do we see? What do we notice? What's strange? What's happening here? And part of it, I think, is just about real estate. It's like hard in the big publications to devote a lot of words and, and space to, to poetry. But, you know, I do wish I saw more of that, like on the internet where, you know, like actual, you know, engagement with the, with the language and stuff. And I don't, I don't, I, I don't see that much of that. There's a, like, again, I mean, I can rattle off a list of pretty good critics who, who write some pretty good stuff. Um, I like, I like um, Eliza Gabbert who writes for the New York Times book reviews, writes, writes really good reviews and some other people write for the book review and Dan Chasen and some other folks, but you know, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough right now that people have their mind on other things, I guess. I do have one hand raised. Audrey, Audrey Aria, do you wanna? Yes, hi, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. I can hear you, yeah. Hi, um, thank you. Yes, yeah, so my question um, relates, of course, to the topic of this conversation. And uh, it's something I read about William Faulkner when I was reading his novel, um, Absalom, Absalom. And I, I read um, an interview um, that was done a long time ago in the Paris Review of Books uh, with him about his writing as a novelist. And well, let me just quickly read that part and then I'll ask two questions if that's okay. Um, he says that maybe every novelist wants to write poetry first finds he cannot and then tries the short story, which is the most demanding form after poetry. And falling and failing at that, only then does he take up novel writing. And he says that he, he of course wrote poems and then he thought that he failed at that. And um, he says that novelists are kind of an inferior breed of writers. It's the poet who holds the top job and the prominent calling, as he says. But when I was reading Absalom, Absalom, I, um, I found it very poetic, like the, the, the prose was poetic. So my first question is, what do you think of Faulkner's uh, comment about poetry and why he didn't pursue his career as a poet? And the second question is, um, how, how do you differentiate or uh, po poetry from the poetic prose? Um, thank you for your questions. Those are great questions. And, um, you know, Faulkner is one of our greatest writers for sure. I mean, I, um, not, not a breakthrough literary opinion there, but, um, but the, um, to answer your first question, I mean, it's funny. I if 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 what he says is true, we're get definitely getting paid an inverse um, an inverse relation to difficulty because novelists certainly get paid a lot better than short story writers who get paid a lot better than poets. But um, the the um, I mean, I can kind of see why he would say that. I think it's a little bit of a um, it's a little tongue in cheek. I think it's sort of it relates. I think it's sort of a long way of saying that. Uh, that saying that's often attributed to Mark Twain, although I don't think it was Twain who said this, that if I'd had time, I would have written a shorter letter. Um, this idea that, you know, like compression and economy of language and economy of thought is like somehow nobler or shows, shows a stronger mind. I don't know if that's true. I mean, I, I, I personally don't agree with his own assessment of, you know, I think Faulkner's novels are as good as any poetry that's ever been written. So, but, you know, in terms of their, worth worth literary worth but um the as far as like how you distinguish between poetic prose and and poetry i mean that's a perfect example of what i'm talking about there's little distinction on the sentence level between faulkner's prose and and and, and lots of poetry but the purpose of faulkner's novels even a novelist like faulkner who's pretty pretty focused on things other than plot 
um, he is making decisions about putting his writing together that are that are beholden to issues of character and setting, and and um, and pl and and plot. Like I said, whereas a poet has no obligation to that, none whatsoever. A poet can veer off at any moment and leave any thought incomplete and abandon things in the middle, all in the interest of some of whatever concept of beauty the poet has. And so, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very big advantage that poets have, but it's also, you know, gives up on some pretty fun things that readers like, like plot and character and setting. So um, there's that famous maxim of Chekhov's, the, 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 the short story writer and playwriter Anton Chekhov, he, Chekhov's gun, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, that that adage that in, about playwriting that if there's a gun on the mantle in the first act, it has to go off by the end of the play. That's 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 kind of like a a rule, a dramatic rule. Well, that's not true about poetry. There can be a gun on the mantle in the beginning of a poem, and it can disappear and never appear again. Um, and in fact, that might actually be better. So that's the difference, and that's why the book is called Why Poetry and not what is a poetic sentence or what is a poetic line or what's poetic language. Um, so that's, that's my long winded answer to your two questions, um, which I really appreciated. And they're, they're great questions. And ones that are, by the way, I mean, you know, I answer them as if definitively, but of course you and I could talk about this for hours and come up with <laughs> new ideas and new questions. So, so I don't mean to shut it down. It's just we're in this weird format we're in where I have to, give a nicely wrapped up bow of an answer um, to your, to your Thank question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. So I do have one um, more hand raised, but if you want to take another question. I was going to say, do you want to do the hand raise and then throw it back to Michael so he can just mention, you know, the poetry? Sure. Thank you. So I have one more hand raised with Hong Van, if that's uh, the full name. Yeah, so I appreciate yeah, that. Yes. Yes. It's my name, Hong Van. Yes. Hi, uh, Hong. I, I have two questions for Matthew. Uh, the first question is, what do you think about poems that have serious subjects like politics and even philosophical themes? And the second uh, uh, question, what about homosexual topic? Do you think most poets try not to write about it? Um. The first, I, I approve greatly of poems that, um, that take on serious subjects. Many of mine do and many other people's do. I just don't think they have to do that. And I, yeah. think, I think about a poem as it can veer back and forth. Um, I think a lot of poets right now are on the forefront of writing about, not just about sexuality, but gender, um, gender identity, um, and I think poetry is an exciting place where um, I think that, that people are expressing themselves and openly, you know, appearing in many different ways. And, and I, think, I think that's a great thing. And I think that's one thing that American poetry can be proud of itself for right now is that it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's uh, mo let's say, moving towards an inclusive space. And I completely support that. And I support people's right to be however they want to be and love whoever they want to love and, and, and become whoever they need to become. And I'm, I'm, I'll fight to the death for that, for that. So, and I'm sure a lot of people here would too. So that's how I feel about that. Not that it really matters, but um, since you asked, that's how I feel about it. You got a one for all like thumbs up for that answer from Hong. So I mean, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> not, it's not, you know, I'm not, again, I'm probably among people who would agree with that, but I just, but I just, you know, since you asked, I, should say and it's great i mean this people are doing a lot i mean american poetry right now it's full of people you know it's really really just become so much more inclusive and diverse and varied it has a long way to go like a, like the rest of our society i'm not saying the work is done by any means but at least it's made strides in that area i would say you know and that's good Kidor, that's it for the hand raises, if you want to continue on. All right. I mean, before people bug out of the room, I want to thank Matthew so much for showing up and listening to us and sharing his work. And then I want to spend two seconds letting Michael tell you if you want a little more discussion of poetry, where you can go. Okay. The, uh, what we're looking at is the, the idea of, of a po poetry forum that we might do, say, once a month at the Arts Club. 
And uh, I would like to do a meeting next week at this time. And anybody who is here is invited to come. If you have ideas, because we, we haven't determined we're actually going to have the forum, but if we come up with enough structure, we might do it. As Matthew said a few minutes ago, you know, we could talk about this for hours and hours. Poetry is fun to talk about. And I think this would be a forum, not for poets and non-poets, this is for po a forum for people who are interested in poetry and might be going, what's going on in poetry. It could also from time to time bring, bring a, poet, a poet a poet in, maybe a notable poet, but other times it could be people sharing poems or it could be simply talking about, here's what's happening in this area of poetry, that area of poetry. So basically it would be an exchange of ideas next week. And if we find enough interesting ideas, we might say, yes, we are going to create a poetry forum, a place where people can come and talk about poetry. So we will be sending out an invitation to you following this. Uh, if you'd like to come to it, all you have to say is, yes, I'd like to come. And that, that will follow up with a, uh, a, a link for this. And it'll be the same time as this or next Thursday at uh, 7 p.m. I said I, everybody should join the Arts Club. <laughs> apparently, apparently you get you apparently you said to show up and say why, and then what you pay a very small fee, a hardly noticeable. <laughs> okay. And then, and then and then you and then you uh, and then you get to be members of the arts club and and hang out with all these like really nice people and and experience all these great events and support what's really clearly a great organization. And um, I plan on supporting it next time I'm back in in the area. So um, so yeah, think about it. I would join if I lived in the, in DC. Hey, there's non-resident members. You're not off the hook. Oh, good. I'm going to join then. That's it. <laughs> great, Thank great. you for the shameless plug. Thank everyone for being here. Um, put your contact information in the chat if we don't already have it, so that we can email you and spam you about all sorts of poetry things <laughs> that we do all the time. Wonderful. So and I'll say to, to follow on from Dort's wrap up, at the end of all of our presentations, we invite everyone to turn on their video to say goodbye and wave and as a thank you for coming out tonight and just to say bye to Matthew and say bye to Dorth and just to see all your lovely faces. We do appreciate our audiences. You're the reason why we do what we do. And thank you once again. And as I like to say, um, as we continue on, as, um, if you like more information about all the other events going on at the Arts Club of Washington, please go to our website, artsclubofwashington.org. Otherwise, the, um, the, you know, we like to say at the end of these things, that is a wrap, folks. Thank you and have a lovely, safe evening. And we hope to see you again real, real soon. Dora? And we yes. will be posting this recording and we hope we will have the captions on when we post it. We fumbled that today. Yeah, we so will, thank you we'll for that. Try Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sasha and Thank you. Matthew. Thank you, everyone. Thank bye, you. Bye. Great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank, bye. You. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs>